Friends, good morning and welcome as we gather to worship God on this Sunday morning, significant and special within the church year. Today is Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. Whether you've gathered from near or far, whether in the pews or watching from further afield via the live stream and the telephone dial-in, welcome. And from whatever tradition of prayer you come or none, we are glad that you are with us today. The order of service and readings, uh, uh, sorry, the order of service is as printed, and our music today is led by Ben Lewis Smith and Catherine Olver. Anthems uh, for Palm Sunday, Ride On by Ives and Pueri Hebrorum by Vittoria. Uh, St. Columbus Elder Isabel Carter may be sharing the readings with us, or it may be a deputy. Uh, thanks to our backroom technicians this morning, Paul Dempsey and Hugh Pym. Uh, later, it will be a great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Saskia Haramina, uh, speaking to us about the Lent charity this year's Firefly International, uh, and more of that uh, as we get towards that point of the service. This morning's service is followed by Holy Communion and combined with prayers for those in special need in the London Scottish Regimental Chapel uh, following uh, the 11 o'clock service. And today we serve refreshments in the upper hall to which you're all most welcome. Uh, two announcements of forthcoming services. The funeral of former St. Columbus elder Ian Thisley uh, it will now take place on Friday the 19th of April at 1.30 at Kakodi Crematorium. And the memorial service for St. Columbus member Elizabeth Sanderson will take place at St. Columbus at 2 p.m. on Tuesday the 9th of April. First, let us take a moment of stillness to catch our breath, to be glad that we're here. And as the candle is lit in our own sanctuary, we invite those perhaps who are watching at home to do something of the same, to mark the place where you watch and pray as sacred too. The psalmist says, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. When they were approaching Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. 
We stand to sing our opening and processional hymn, 365, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. The second liturgy of the Psalms is taken from John chapter 12, verses 13 to 19. John chapter 12, verses 13 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb 
and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. And the Pharisees then said one to another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Ride on, ride on in majesty, ride on in lowly pomp to die. Winged squadrons of the sky look down with sad and wandering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Heavenly Father, on this roller coaster Sabbath day, movement and symbol, procession and prayer, crosses clutched in palms of our hands. On this roller coaster Sabbath day, illuminate our imaginations and deepen our understandings with the stories that lie at the heart of our faith to the cross and beyond. On this roller coaster Sabbath day, lead us from joyous entry to Jerusalem the Golden, on, on to the dark tales of Christ's final days. The slow reducing of the light the quiet desertions of the disciples, the cruelties of the mob, the callousness of unchecked power. To the cross and beyond. On this roller coaster Sabbath day, make us ready to receive you strange dissident of meekness, coming to overturn the status quo, to offer one final glorious plea for the life of the world, one eternal summons to peace, one last testimony to the power of love. Behold, the last and fiercest strife is nigh. So bow thy meek head to mortal pain. Then take, O God, thy power and reign. As we stand at the dawn of Holy Week, rejoicing first with the festival throng, yet knowing within our hearts the fickleness of the crowd and of ourselves, the fearfulness and betrayals to come echo sometimes of our own lives. Forgive us the shallowness of our faith. Forgive us the timidity of our following. Forgive us the ready excuses and alternative idols. Forgive us the violence that we hold in our own persons. Heavenly Father, remind us that you came in the shape of your Son, Jesus Christ, to forgive and to restore. Make that known to us as we approach the awful intensity of this week to come. Stir up in us the gifts of faith and courage to watch, to wait, to pray. Stir up in us the gifts of faith and courage that we might honor you with our lips and praise you with our lives. Stir in us the gifts of faith and courage 
to travel these final days, that enduring your death, we may discover your resurrection. So in the words that Jesus taught, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We sing again hymn 474, Hail to the Lord's Anointed.
Friends, as you know, our Sunday Gospel readings are divided into three cycles. Year A for Matthew, Year B for Mark, Year C for Luke. St. John's Gospel is read during all three cycles, especially during Lent and the Easter season. In Holy Week, the Passion narratives are read on this Passion or Palm Sunday and on Good Friday. We hear Matthew, year A, Mark, year B, and Luke, year C. St. John's account of the Passion is read every year. The Passion narrative is introduced as the Passion of our Lord according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It is the Passion story from their viewpoint. They wrote for different audiences and communities and emphasized different aspects of the truth in order to reach out to the needs of their respective audiences or communities. The life, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus was first preached and then written down, and Mark's gospel was written after the fall of Jerusalem, around 70 AD. And St. John's gospel, according to most scholars, at the turn of the century, 90 to 100 AD. The church grew and developed initially within Judaism, but gradually became increasingly different and separated from, <laughs> from the synagogue. In some places, Christians were driven out of the synagogue, and very often the opponents of Jesus are identified with those whom the Christians 30, 40, 50 years later regarded as opponents. If these Christians were Gentiles, they may speak of those opponents as Jews, and so you may find in John that the Jews are opposed to Jesus. What happened earlier in the 30s has been translated to the life situation of the Christians in the 60s, 90s, and in later history that was repeated and was made into opposition between Christians and Jews down the centuries. So we must be very careful when we hear the passion stories that we do not hear them from an anti-Jewish point of view. Remember that Jesus was Jewish. The authorities were Jewish. So if there was antagonism towards him, it was not Jewish antagonism towards Christians. These were struggles of people of the same background from their same religious society who, and family who were in opposition to Jesus. And there was opposition. People had different motives for being opposed to Jesus. It was not just the religious authorities who were opposed to Jesus. He was supposed to have spoken against the temple. A lot of people were employed working on temple re renovation. There was the hospitality sector providing food and lodging for pilgrims. Any threat to the temple could touch those people. They could also be upset for religious reasons because that was a sacred building and if Jesus was a prophet and saying that it was going to be destroyed, that could threaten religion and also threaten the economy. So in opposition to a figure like Jesus, there could be a whole complexity of motives. Mark is writing for a people who are suffering and being persecuted. He emphasizes opposition to Jesus right through the gospel story. He also emphasizes Jesus' humanity. Jesus suffered, but he was faithful. Mark's gospel, written after the fall of Jerusalem, as we said, around 70 AD. It was a time of persecution. Followers of Jesus were being excluded from the synagogues. There were problems with the new growing numbers of Gentiles joining the young church and their relationship with the Jewish tradition. Should they become Jewish before they became Christian? Or could they become, move from their Gentile traditions and faith into the Christian church? It was a great debate in the early church. Meanwhile, Nero was in Rome and Christians were being persecuted there. 
Mark wrote for a community that had very recently experienced a sharp and devastating persecution. Some Christians died a martyr's death. Others lost faith, denied their faith, and in some cases, some Christians turned in other Christians. There were Jewish-Greek divisions. Some who were believers were tempted to deny Christ in order to avoid suffering. They were asking the why of suffering, as we have done, all of us, down the ages. It is in this sort of context that Mark tells the story of Christ. Mark seems particularly designed to address failure in community leadership, keyed up in expectation of Jesus' imminent return as Son of Man and Judge of the world, the community felt dismay and disillusionment at the seemingly endless postponement of that return, despite the presence of signs and portents suggesting that it was close at hand, notably the destruction and fall of Jerusalem to Roman armies in 70 AD. Cut off from the synagogue and temple, they had made their houses the place of worship where they could experience the presence and power of Jesus. Mark's gospel also, particularly in the way it presents the male disciples of Jesus, appears to address a situation in which leadership has failed, in which family life in particular has been torn apart by persecution, and in which women have done better than men in coping with the suffering that was inevitable for those following Jesus. Mark's presentation of the Passion is the darkest and the most agonizing, with only occasional light. We see the tragedy of the Passion. The story begins after the Last Supper with Jesus and the disciples having sung a hymn going to the Mount of Olives. Jesus' first words to his disciples, you will all lose faith for scripture says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. These were shattering words for the disciples. To be scattered at the passion and to lose faith. At the last supper, Jesus had already told them that one would hand him over and betray him. Peter objects, saying that even if all lose faith, he will not, only to be told that he will deny Jesus three times that very night. So we get a presentation where one, and we know it was Judas, will betray him, all will be scattered, and Peter will deny him three times. These dire predictions are fulfilled as at the time Jesus stands before the Jewish authorities witnessing to the truth. Mark gives us a stark picture of Jesus' suffering. He stresses the humanity of Christ, that Jesus, who did not want to die but followed his Father's will rather than his own safety. Mark is inviting his audience and us to choose fidelity and to trust in the God who was with Jesus even in death when Jesus felt deserted and cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Mark, the first passage from Mark chapter 14 will be read by Angus. A reading of the Passion according to Mark. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, 
his disciples said to Jesus, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. He said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here, keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed as willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. 
Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching. You did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked.
continue our and at verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the chief priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, you also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the courtyard. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Amen. Hymn 378, Praise to the Holiest in the Height.
As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. (coughs) Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. They clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. They began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha ha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sakabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, 
Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he'd been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen cloth And taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid.
from the sketches of scripture to the realities and possibilities of today, from the impetus of the gospel to the chance to respond, word and action. It is a great pleasure to welcome this morning to St. Columbus, Saska Haramina, who will speak on behalf of our Lent appeal for Firefly International. In the mid-1990s, Saska worked in Mostar as a war reporter, later completing an MA in philosophy and politics at Edinburgh University, an MA in human rights and democratization at Bologna in Italy and Sarajevo in Bosnia. She's worked for the UN and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, helping to create media space in which voices for peace can be heard and always aiming to bring together communities torn apart by the former Yugoslav civil war. She has been involved with Svitak, which we'll hear about this morning since its inception, and she's been a trustee of Firefly International since 2022. In the UK, Saska has worked in social care and in the arts. She currently runs a zero-waste sourdough bakery in Edinburgh and promotes events for Balkan music and culture. We're delighted to hear from you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It is absolutely wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for welcoming us and thank you for choosing Svitats for your Lent appeal. Um, I understand that Jane, who's our director, was here in February and she told you a little bit about Firefly International and what we do. But I'm here to give you a bit more background about what Svitats is doing in Brčko, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and why that, their work is more important than ever, really, today. Um, in 1992, Sarajevo, which is the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, was one of the most um, ethnically mixed cities in Europe. Over 50% of marriages in Sarajevo in 1992 were interreligious. In the center of the city, within 500 meters square, there is a synagogue, an Orthodox church, a Catholic church, and a mosque. These communities coexisted and lived pretty much peacefully, celebrating each other's religious holidays. It was quite a unique situation in Europe to have such an ethnically mixed yet harmonious place. I'm telling you all of this just to demonstrate what civil war in Bosnia did to these communities. It tore the fabric of society completely. It wasn't the case that people lived separately. People really lived together. Within one tenement, you would have people of different ethnicities, all sharing life, children playing together, eating each other food, just doing what neighbors do. The war completely tore this apart due to ethnic cleansing and atrocities. People, families were pulled apart and ended up living in different parts. As a result of this, so if you can imagine all the horrors of war, no food, death, no electricity, people, fear, fear for your own personal safety, for your family members. So the aftermath of war was people having lived through all of this they have also lost their original communities and they have found themselves in, so to speak, ethnically cleansed areas. This means that the future generations do not have recollection of what it was like to live with your neighbors in peace and harmony. What they actually have as their daily reality is a big dose of hatred and a big dose of sort of vilifying the other side. So the children and young people growing up in Bosnia and Herzegovina today, their education is segregated, their, all their extracurricular activities are segregated. It is really hard for these children to meet the children of other ethnicities and share their childhood and their lives with them. And the most important thing about sharing really is people being able to recognize each other's humanity and to build friendships across these lines of division. So what Firefly does, it provides this space. So Svitats is a project that 
small number of people from Berchko who were striving to rebuild their communities, they have initiated this project and what we have done is help them actually run this project and we've been helping them to do so for over 25 years. Now, this has been, um, I'm not sure what the word is in English, a beacon of light. It has been this incredible space which was so unique for people to be able to, children to be able to spend time with each other and understand that someone is primarily your friend and then they are maybe a Muslim or a Catholic or an Orthodox or a Jew but they're your friend who you play guitar with and who you play with and they're a human being, same as yourself. Now this may sound really obvious to us living in this reality, but there people get persecuted for having these interreligious friendships and it's actually quite brave to uphold these kind of views. So as much as we actually support people through financial means to maintain these centers and these places when people can be together, we also give them uh, a support in terms of just alliance and supporting their views that are considered by some too open-minded. Why is this incredibly important today? So Europe as it is, this is probably the most, should we say, ethnically mixed place in Europe nowadays. And with conflicts, recent conflicts such as ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia, Orthodox Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina have been really vocal in supporting Russians. And what this means is that the ethnic, on a small scale, the ethnic tensions um, are playing out in these local communities and they're really volatile. And in a way, Sarajevo being at the sort of geographically based in the center of Europe, Southeastern Europe and crossroads of civilizations, it is just, the place that can destabilize the whole region, basically. And although facilitating these young people to be together and build peace seems like such a tiny seed of something, it is a really important seed of future stability, future peace, just general harmony and stability for the wider context, the European context. Um, thank you so much for taking your time uh, to listen to me or for inviting me here. And I really hope that um, you find it in you to support our Wealth Bar cause uh, because these, um, these children really need you and so do their parents who we link through their children because we are rebuilding communities by giving children opportunity to experience each other. So thank you so much um, for having us. Thank you, Saskia, and I know that Saskia said she'll be joining us for tea and coffee in the hall after the service, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Hymn 355, You Lord Are Both Lamb and Shepherd. No? Oh, sorry, my eye went down the, the, the order of service. Uh, our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Almighty God, we praise you for calling disciples to follow Jesus, for their lives and their witness, for their successes and failures. We praise you for the way you reveal yourself to us through people and events, through noise and silence, through light and dark. We praise you for revealing yourself to us through gospel <coughs> stories, the writings of the prophets, and the letters written by your early followers. We praise you for revealing yourself to us in the ordinary events of life and in the extraordinary events and encounters that amaze and startle us. For all of this, 
and for so much more. We praise you, O God, in the name of Jesus, King of Kings. Lord Jesus Christ, you entered Jerusalem in quiet humility, taking the form of a servant even to the point of death on a cross, emptying yourself so that we might be filled. Come again now and establish your kingdom. Come afresh to our troubled world with all its needs, its tensions, its problems, and its evil. Bring healing where there is division, love where there is hatred, hope where there is despair, joy where there is sorrow, confidence where there is fear, strength where there is weakness, healing where there is sickness, life where there is death. Hear us as we pray for the work of Firefly International, bringing together your children of different races and creeds, working towards a better future for all. Lord Jesus Christ, reach out to your church and the world Despite the weakness of our faith and the rejection of so many, may your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Come again now and establish your kingdom, for in your name we pray. Amen. Friends, just one or two things uh, before our closing hymn. Um, there is a retiring, <coughs> excuse me, there's a retiring offering for the continuing work of St. Columbus, and you can donate via the tap and go or via the website. In addition, uh, very much reinforcing what's already been said on behalf of the Lent appeal, the white gift aid um, envelopes are in the pews, and they would be very happily received on the trays at the back. There are a variety of ways to contribute to Firefly International uh, and details of that are all on the website uh, in the weekly newsletter. Um, Holy Week um, is stretching before us and uh, we have Wednesday prayers at one o'clock in the London Scottish Chapel, uh, the last in the Lenten series of those. Monday, Thursday, we celebrate communion at 8 p.m. again in the London Scottish Chapel. And in a slight innovation this year, uh, we're offering uh, a light supper, a bit of hospitality from 7 o'clock onwards uh, in the upper hall, uh, a sandwich and a cup of tea. Um, a chance to get together before we celebrate communion together. On Good Friday, the service of words and music uh, begins at 11 o'clock and there's a hot cross bun to share uh, after that. A reminder that for Easter Sunday, where we will celebrate Holy Communion um, with all bells and whistles, uh, the, it, the next weekend the clocks go forward. Um, so it's a particularly tricky one to get wrong next week. Um, you have been warned. Uh, today, communion um, with prayers for those in special need after the morning service and refreshments downstairs. And the glass door night shelter continues this evening, week, I think, 19 of the season. And as always, we ask you to keep both staff, volunteers, and guests uh, in your thoughts today. Our closing hymn, 355, You, Lord, are both Lamb and Shepherd.
the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus... <laughs> Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now go in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this holy week and forevermore.